Hey, everybody, this is Faygo Franklin III, and I'm here with a couple of great guests. We are here with the representatives for 24H campaign. First and foremost, how's everybody doing? Pretty good. Amazing. Awesome. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm well. I'm well. I can't complain. I can't complain. So we're going to just jump right in it because I know that um, y'all are a little bit busy. So first and foremost, um, <clears throat> what, what got y'all inspired to start this campaign? Well, um, being in um, entertainment gig workers, um, I am actually a event producer in Hollywood. So I've done numerous events backstage, from backstage daytime Emmys to basically any award show, Oscars after parties, et cetera. Um, so when COVID hit us, we saw a slew of our event, live event production like Coachella, South by Southwest, Cannes Film Festival, um, BT Awards, Soul Train Awards, Essence, etc. got canceled. Um, and just from speaking and checking in with other gig workers who we contracted, like our photographers, um, our videographers, our hair and makeup team, they all ha were on the same lens. And we got a couple of links to basically apply for when Congress passed the stimulus package. But lo and behold, it only qualifies certain people who made on their certain threshold, which was on the 99K. And most of us who are in the entertainment fields, if we do two contracts for the year, we're over that. So it left us having to figure out SBA loans, PPEs, which as you know, once they launched those programs, they were, the funds literally was gone within hours in some states and in some cities. So the common thread was again through our colleagues, like, I'm not sure how I'm going to survive. Okay, our landlord is giving us a extension, but it's not, you still have to pay rent. So even though you have a four or five month extension, at the end of not working or when our live production comes back, how are we figuring out those lost months that we still have to figure out how to catch up with? So it was just a common thread between our immediate circle that we felt that if we were feeling this, we know there was hundreds of other entertainment gig workers from hairdressers, makeup artists, film producers, directors, um, independent artists who live gigs were canceled that we were part of production. Um, you know, the choreographers, the dancers, the DJs, we know that it was widespread and very few gig workers are protected. Some of the independent and, and independent artists. So if you're a recording artist and you're assigned to a label, okay, you may be on the, that music care umbrella that can provide some sort of funding for you. Or if you are a part of the SAG or Guild, those apply, but there are hundreds of thousands of independent gig workers that are not covered. And even some who make on there who got a stimulus package $1,200 for a family of four. Now tell me whose rent is about 2000 2800 a month. How are they going to catch up? It's, it's so it was just, we felt that we needed to do something um, to basically, because the, it was a majority of voices out there, the, you know, that people just felt that we were okay and we weren't. So hence the reason we got our colleagues together and decided to basically, um, I reach out to Ion and Moses, who is not on the call because we've worked together for a number of years um, doing live events production and different collaborations. And we just got together and hence that was the birth of 24H. Um, how can freelancers and other individuals apply uh, for for this, uh, for this fund, and what is the requirement? Um, the requirement is to to be an entrepreneur in the gig economy. Um, as Annette was just saying, that um, this was the overlooked um, small business that the government had forgotten. No one thought about the entertainment people for, for entrepreneurs in the entertainment space. 
So um, anyone who's been in business for six months or longer, um, they qualify for this. Um, you know, um, we also have other dynamics where, you know, because of times of change where um, we have other initiatives beyond the COVID relief form, but most of the, of the people um, have been negatively impacted by this. Um, it's just not enough money coming from the um, federal level to ensure that um, they're financially stable. They don't qualify for unemployment benefits because they're in the gig economy, because they're independent contractors. So there really is no relief for these people. Um, some might um, fall into that threshold where they work for a production company or a studio where they can um, qualify for such benefits. But most people in the entertainment space are independent contractors, for lack of a better term. What so any independent guys? contractor okay. who... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, okay. So any independent contractor who's been in business and, you know, they could prove that, they're, you know, that they've had a viable income in the industry qualifies for, you know, the, our COVID relief funds. Um, you know, we do our due diligence. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts with 24H. Um, there is a nonprofit dynamic to it. So, you know, we have to remain above board and who we give out money to. But, um, you know, it's very easy to, you know, to, dis, um, to dis disseminate, you know, who qualifies. And, you know, we have to be given some credit because um, Annette and Allende, you know, we've employed a lot of people in the gig space um, while doing these productions. You know, um, it, it, it does come at a cost. And um, also, I mean, the process is as simple for someone that would, that would like to apply. It's as simple as going to the website, www.24hww.com, and just simply filling out a questionnaire. It's a simple application. Um, nothing really uh, extenuating or complex. We wanted to make it as simple for people to uh, apply and receive as possible. So it's just a simple form. Okay. Um, what advice or tips can you give young freelancers right now that are freaking out that want to kind of get um, into a better space and, and try to have a positive mindset right now because everybody is freaking out um, because of the COVID-19? Well, I'd say, I mean, this is a great time for people to just be creative, you know, overall, um, especially um, those that are, you know, a lot younger um, uh, minded, this is a good time for them to put that, that useful thought, thoughtfulness to work, be innovative. Um, obviously, everything is going digital right now. So social media, um, content creation, just on a digital sense, on digital platforms is really where I think people should be um, skewing their thoughts towards, which is why we've had this initiative beyond the stage um, and streaming that live digitally you know, with social distancing and things like that, we'll, we'll start to see a lot more of those become norm in different verticals, different sectors, just across the board. And, you know, I, being that the youthful generation is very much in tune with digital, I think they should be, you know, skewing their efforts towards being creative in that sense. I think that's where the most opportunity is going to come right now. We also have um, each week, um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at our programming, but each week we featured independent artists that um, they can submit their music and can get an opportunity. They don't have to be verified. They just have to have great content. And we actually are showcasing in, an independent artist each week. So we've been doing that. Also, we had some amazing partners who have platforms for independent artists like Tweedle, is one of our partners and they have an amazing, if you look, um, go to Tweedle, I think it's w -T -W -E -E -D -L -E. Um, They have an amazing platform for independent artists to basically, it's like a Spotify, a submit their music and basically, um, so people can have a wide audience. And I think Ion, they may have some numbers on the amount of artists they have and the reach that they have. But as back to what Ion, they said is about being creative. If you can come out of COVID and everything that's happening right now, because right after COVID, COVID wasn't even, it's not even plateauing. We actually see the Black Lives Matters happen and which driven 24H to actually initiate another campaign through our nonprofit and some of our legal partners. So it's about using your voice and being creative during this time because 
a lot of people don't realize their capabilities and if they actually use their voice, they, um, you, you will be able to be heard. So hence the reason we were able to give individual independent artists, young people, this platform to be heard. <clears throat> and with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, how do you personally feel about some of the changes that we see today? Um, because I know the entertainment industry um, it is not as diverse as it should be. Um, what do you think of the changes that are being made right now as we see in America? I actually was listening to CNN this morning and um, one of the commentators says, um, we all got fed into this saying um, that the system is broken, but as African Americans, you can't broke something that was never, it, it, for instance, it was, it, this was happening for so long. So I won't say, and I agree totally with them this morning that the system is not broken. It was just that way all along, but with the digital space, as Will Smith said, digital space and people using their phone, it's now light on it. And it's for us to basically band together, to basically have a voice, the 24 HV, um, with our legal partner, Tevon. Tevon is one of our attorney on board. So we actually created the Legal Defense Fund um, to assist people with bail. And he can go into that sort of program that we're about to actually launch um, because it's so needed. And there is so many people who experience police um, brutality racial disparity, whether it be at the hands of law, legal enforcement, but in general. And um, their voices aren't heard because there's not a platform. And I think now that it's being brought to light, it's, um, it, it's a good thing, but we have to figure out what do we do and to use this platform or this time to really seriously make some changes because being aware of something and not making the changes, it's like we'll be back at the same place next year or, or the following year. So we really have to figure out um, intellectually, how do we make significant change other than protesting? And we, I definitely agree with the protesting, but we definitely using our voice, but we have to basically go to Congress and demand change and make sure these laws are written and to use our voice. So um, Tavon can probably pick up, on, pick up on the legal end of that. So we launched, launched two initiatives. One is the Legal Defense Fund. The demonstrators out there who are protesting, you know, they need legal aid, um, legal representation. They need finances for bail. So we partnered with a lot of bail, um, um, bail bond organizations across the country, you know, to bond out um, some of these demonstrators. Every state varies. Some people are being released on their own. Some demonstrators are being released on their own recognizance. Other states who have hefty bond fees for demonstrations and looting and rioting, even if you weren't a looter or rioter because you were out there, as my mother used to say, um, beware the company you keep and, um, mm -hmm. You just, you're guilty by association. Like you might be 10 feet away from, you know, some people breaking into stores and they're, they're rounding up everyone. So coming into L LA, seeing that that was a big problem, you know, we, we retroactively um, formed the Legal Defense Fund and found that, you know, we do need legislative reform. Um, Absolutely. So we, we also formed a um, coalition for progressive legislation where we raise money and we employ lobbyists you know, to go and lobby in the Beltway and in D.C. and to um, be our advocates, you know, for the legislation, the bills that we want to have that impacts urban and um, communities of color. You know, we, one of the things in the Black community is that we, you know, we will march for everything, but, you know, we haven't put our resources into the right mechanisms to really impact change. It's more than just voting. You need capital. So even if you vote for the right politician and you get that politician on the Hill or in the Senate, what, what, um, what, where's the machine behind you that's gonna ensure that that legislation, that that bill, you know, gets passed throughout Congress? You know, I, um, I was an intern for um, Senator Lieberman for um, about a year um, right out of undergrad and I, and I saw how Washington works. 
and Washington doesn't just work with, you know, good initiatives, you actually need capital, you need resources. Mm -hmm. And in our communities, that's one of the things that, um, you know, that has been one of the forgotten things where we collectively put our money together so that we could get laws on the books that protects us. Everything that we're asking for, we need to put our money where our mouths is. But to further input, um, expound upon that with the Black Lives Matter movement, one of the rewarding things to see is there are so many um, corporations that are pledging money um, for these social in initiatives. Today, um, I believe the Netflix, um, the um, CEO of Netflix and his wife pledged $120 million to HBCUs. You know, there's been you know, a lot of talk where we want more people of color to support and go get their degree from an HBCU, but we don't think about the financing dynamic of, of that. So with more corporations being, trying to be socially, you know, responsible mm -hmm. by bringing on um, more people of color or more diversity to their board, because every board has that Black person that's the social um, representative, the the director of social diversity, and then all of the other positions are just white. Nice. Um, now that they're being cognizant, okay, mm -hmm. like, you know, there's really a disparity between representation and representation matters. So like, it's a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, we had to see things get burnt down and, <laughs> and things for that to have that type of change. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, Hopefully we're moving in the right direction on the legislative front, um, for police reform, judicial reform, and you know, employment reform as well. Policy reform overall, we need policy reform. That's where we need to go from here because mm -hmm. it's one thing to voice mm -hmm. ourselves, but the, what's the action, you know? So this, the, the marching and everything is the call to action for policy yeah. reform. And that's where we go next in terms of implementing things that, you know, that prevent these atrocities from happening ever again, right? Or if they happen, mm -hmm. there's a swift repercussion that is clearly defined. As of right now, there's so much gray area that, you know, a lot of enforcement is operating in and policy that's been set in place that allows them to con continue to do that. But until we get those things changed, we're just gonna be on this treadmill or this, this hamster wheel rather over and over again, mm -hmm. you know? So we really have to look okay. at it as policy reform. Yeah, and just to oh, add, I'm not sure if you noticed, two days ago, um, President Trump issued a uh, um, police reform bill mm -hmm. through, through, via an executive order. He just backdoored $6 billion in additional money that was supposed to be defunding the police. You know, exactly. and defunding doesn't mean taking away money to get rid of police. It's demilitarizing police. I was once in the military. Um, we don't bring back home any of our armaments back into the government back into the states. What we do is we resell it or we'll, we'll resell it to um, various police unions and um, organizations across the country. So then you have, you know, some police statements, um, police organizations, preferably like NYPD, they walk around looking like the Gestapo. They have drones, they have, <laughs> they have gunships, <laughs> they have everything, mm -hmm. tanks, you name it. Mm -hmm. And it's armed just helicopters, ridiculous. All of that. Armed, all of it. And it's just ridiculous where you know, they're treating um, you, um, taxpayers like insurgents. Like, I shouldn't get treated mm -hmm. like an insurgent in Iraq <laughs> or, in, or in Afghanistan um, because, you know, some trigger-happy cop wants to use some new toys. <laughs> it's absurd. But pardon me for segueing on, over to that. <laughs> so my next question is, um, I know it's a heavy topic. How can you, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, awesome. 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 Um, I, okay. Awesome. My next question is, I know a lot of people do not want to talk about, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, but how can we sit here and have a discussion with the executive people that are white and as well as other um, individuals and talk about all lives matter? How do we have a conversation with them as mature adults? and get them to see exactly what an African-American or a person of color go through each and every day? Um, within the Black community, um, we need an agenda, you know, and we're very, you know, it's very, um, various sects in, to, in terms of what we want, what, 
what what's the action items that we want that's immediate. We know that police reform is one of them, but who speaks for the community um, for that? And you know, that becomes a little bit problematic. One of the good things that we are seeing from a lot of the corporations across the country is, you know, they're willing and open to having that conversation. They do understand. There's no negative connotation with Black Lives Matter as it was in 2013 with Torina Rice and um, um, Trayvon Martin. Like kneeling from what the, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick's um, um, peaceful protest isn't seen as, you know, dereliction to the flag or disrespect to, to the men and women who serve this country and the armed forces. They understand that those are two separate conversations and they, for years it was just being convoluted. We're not gonna talk about who convoluted the conversation, but they're realizing, oh, everything that goes viral, you know, the more and more people who have these apps and are able to open up their phones to record these atrocities of people getting killed unarmed, like white people are like, you know, they're more empathetic now. More so mm -hmm. than they're like, oh, this is getting out of hand. This is ridiculous. Why is this, why is it disproportionately impacting people of color as opposed to white people? They're saying, I never get treated like this. I can have a, an, a, an encounter with law enforcement and walk away with my life, but black men and women can't. So, you know, now that there's acknowledgement across the board, I feel like we're in a better position to move forward. Do we have the right people in, 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 in government, you know, to make that transition easy, that's, you know, that's another conversation. Luckily, we have an election coming up in November that we know where we can address some of those issues. But collectively with the companies behind us, even the NFL, Roger the Goodell had to go back and retract some of the things that he stated. And that's one of the most powerful organizations in the country. They literally own two days of the week. One used to belong to God, which was Sunday. Now it belongs <laughs> to the NFL. So you know, as the as the as the um you know the people that hold the purse strings to America, you know, are on board with Black Lives Matter and uh, um, helping us push change. I think collectively there's been about thirty billion dollars pledged thus far. Who the money goes to, how the money gets spent, you know, that accountability remains to be said, like, and that's, we'll just see that in time, you know, like we'll, we'll be able to, to readdress some of these um, matters in five years, three to five years. Okay, where are we at now in 2020, 23, as opposed to where we were at in 2020? Has there been some change? Um, have some of these corporations truly, you know, added people of color in various um, leadership roles? Like there's black women are the most educated women on the face of the planet, why aren't they more, they more representative across the board in terms of, you know, executive positions? The most educated women you have, of course, they have 10 and three degrees. I feel like black women collect degrees like Yu-Gi-Oh cards, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not being represented in corporate America. Um, so, you know, we, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see a change like these, these CEOs will put their money where their mouths are. You know, we'll see um, more people of color in, and leadership positions, but that takes time. You know, we it's some things that you know we want to see an immediate change. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so, do you feel like um, that there's going to be some type of normalcy with moving forward within the entertainment field in the next couple of months? Normalcy. Um, that's subjective. I mean, we are going through a very turbulent time with layers upon layers of turbulence, right? So once we get past the first, <laughs> then we got to worry about the second, you know? So I don't think that, you know, there's going to be a new normal is basically what we're going to get back to, a new normal, right? Um, social distancing mm -hmm. is one of the factors that we all have to be accountable for, and that's definitely impacting the entertainment industry amongst other sectors, you know, and, and verticals. But, um, you know, studios, uh, live entertainment for one, you know, what's a normal concert going to be? What's a normal festival going to be? What's a normal award show going to be? We got to take all these things into consideration, you know, um, and who knows, but I know digital, I feel like digital is going to be a, a, a big part of that. Um, just based off of the accessibility that it provides across the board to everyone, you know, 
Um, I think we have to really come to grips with digital being the next wave. If we look at what's exactly. going across the world globally, Beijing just shut down their schools again. So that second mm -hmm. wave is very much real. Um, unfortunately, we can't like predict what COVID-19 will do in America and other places as well. So, you know, technology kills every, every profession. You know, hopefully, you know, we adapt and our platform gives indie artists and established artists um, ways to monetize their craft and their field. Um, but, you know, that going and gathering in concerts and festivals and theaters and stuff like that, that's going to be a thing of the past, at least for the foreseeable future, for the rest of 2020. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you have another outbreak, you're talking about liabilities. Who's liable for the outbreak if you got if you catch COVID at a concert? Like even Donald Trump, his last rally, he made his um, participants sign waivers. So who's mm -hmm. willing to sign a waiver to go into for for entertainment? <laughs> like who's sending their kids back to school? I'm not sending my kids back to school with COVID. Well, we so see, well, we see. Um... Las Vegas opened last weekend, and what we saw was um, every casino had the temperature scan. So everyone who was entering a Las Vegas casino had to be scanned. And if your temperature was over a certain amount, a certain thing that you don't, you basically didn't get access. It's the same thing with um, Dave Chappelle when he had his concert. I looked at the concert, and everyone who basically drove up on property was scanned. So it reminded us of the movie, um, I Am Legend. Um, <laughs> you know. So, but um, doing production, um, I work with the BT and about seven days ago, I got a email um, for sponsorship. And I was like, so we're on, we're doing BT. And they says, oh, we're doing it virtually. And I was like, okay so how does this work so literally i was on a production call on monday and they're trying to basically format the show a virtual show as if it's a live show including a gift launch and a celebrity experience and i'm like i'm trying to wrap around how this is going to make sense to um sponsors and the only thing that makes sense is spot for me to sponsor because you're supporting Black Entertainment Network. Other than that, I don't see any companies basically shipping out money for a virtual experience. Um, same goes for um, Essence. Essence, as we know, is back on two weekends and they're doing a virtual two weekends. So it's actually, we're seeing that wave, but also we're seeing I do the Oscars every year and we got notification for Oscars. They has pushed the Oscars back from February mm -hmm. to now the 25th, I believe, April. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually is going forward with not a virtual, for now uh, actual, um, hope, hoping that we get back to normal by April. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of how do you now fit in clients and brands and sponsors into these virtual digital experiences. Exactly. And the last question I'm going to ask you is, what advice could you give young people about going toward their dreams and making it happen? Wow. I just say it's about sticking with your dreams. During this time, it's so we as professional, I, I, I'm sure, and I say this to myself, there's days where you get up and you feel so discouraged with everything happening when you look at the television. So a lot of times I try not to turn on the news or stay off social media because sometimes it's actually so depressing. So with young people being vocal and being out there, I just think that we see in a lot of people who have a mental breakdown. So I think it's about praying, be, becoming spiritual, finding out during this time who you are as an individual and basically being consistent, stick with it and know that this too shall pass. Um, and and we all go through, it's about, um, it's like, Tavon, you have to mute your phone. Um, Sorry. Yeah, it's about, um, it's like a diamond. Um, you actually have to, in order to get that great quality, you actually have to go through all of these layers. 
to basically come through from a rough stone. So I believe all of this, when we get out of this, is going to make us a better, stronger nation, a better, stronger human being. But you have to be consistent and basically try to avoid negativity because in this day it's so hard to avoid negativity. But if you try to avoid it and be consistent and be positive, I think you can see the light at the tunnel at the end of the road. So it's about consistency. Amen. Hey, Vaughn, you want I, the last, uh, last word? Sure, I agree with Annette 100%. Like, you have to be resilient, you know, through the process and the struggle. Like, I'm not sure if you're a basketball fan, but you got to trust the process. You know, um, when you're embarking mm -hmm. on a road of being an entrepreneur, you know, you're going to struggle. Like, but look at every, you know, successful black person that, that could tell you, you know, woe stories of when they were homeless or, you know, they didn't know where their next meal is going to come from. Like they're financing their dreams and their endeavors. And I think this is the opportunistic time, even though, you know, we're living through a pandemic for anyone that has, you know, a, a realistic dream, an obtainable dream, you know, that they could put to fruition. You know, there's no better time than now to enact that and, you know, put it into process. So hopefully, you know, all of the young, you know, burgeoning um, entrepreneurs and contractors, you know, they get their dreams out there and, you know, put it into action because um, um, the digital, um, the digital era, you know, makes everything easily obtainable and cheaper. Like you can do things at an affordable level that you couldn't do 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So. Hopefully they use technology to the fullest to the their fullest extent and make things happen. So and Mr. That's all. And, Mr. and Mr. Sandy, um, I want your perspective on some encouraging words for people that are going out there out there towards their dreams. What advice can you give them about going to their dreams and having a leap of faith? Um, you just have to go after it. You know, this isn't really a time for people to kind of like second guess themselves. Everyone, we we all have a global reset, but a global reset button that's been hit, you know. So um, for the most part, everyone's pretty much leveled off at ground zero. You know, corporations, um, you know, major investors, media companies, major platforms everyone's trying to figure out where you go from here how they reinvent themselves you know we're discovering holes and systems that should have been fixed a long time ago or replaced so this is a great time for people to just go after it because um doing so you also become part of the solution and if you just sit back and kind of you know wait for things to happen or for the solution to present itself then where's your contribution to to evolution, you know? So it's just about being active at this time. It's everyone's responsibility socially, as well as, you know, all other aspects. I mean, we're, we're all figuring it out as we go along. And I, can I interject and say that that is what I understand say for back on our social justice initiative that we're doing, we encourage Americans, especially African-Americans young people to know their rights and to basically sometimes it's not about fighting you know your grandparents or older adults would always say if you try to fight every dog that barks at you while you're on your journey you will never get to that destination or that journey so if you know your rights there's a lot of times you can fight the system and fight people silently without the police system, the judicial system, that's the, anyone oppressing you, you can fight them once you become aware of your rights and you know your rights um, and you basically get the right people and team. So it's about, so I definitely encourage people as they're going out there to protest and um, they have to be aware of their constitutional right. They have to be, uh, uh, their rights, their civil rights um, because civil rights is human rights. Amen. So in closing statement, thank you for allowing me to actually do an interview with each and every one of y'all. I'm definitely appreciative of the words of wisdom that you have given me as well as my viewers. So definitely have a blessed and productive day and we will definitely stay in touch.
definitely. Oh, definitely. And make sure you go follow us at 24H underscore worldwide. And check us out. Hey, everybody, so let's go, let's go follow them and let's make it happen. Yes. Don't forget hey, to follow so them. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Someone <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, our legal defense fund needs its IG view is up. So please follow us at 24H Legal Defense Fund. Um, you'll see all of our social in initiatives there. Um, and if anyone needs any pro bono legal service, contact us at info at um, 24HRelief.org. Um, and, you know, we provide bail, um, pro bono legal services and we work with a number of um, bail bond organizations um, nationwide to make sure that you're not, you know, stuck in prison because you don't have the means to post bond. And that'd be all. I just want to encourage people to apply, you know, for the uh, 24H COVID relief fund. Simply just go to 24HWW.com and it's a pretty application. You can just fill it out and, um, you know, get in queue. Thank you again and definitely we'll stay in touch. Thanks. Oh, definitely. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Fago. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.